Dr. Danny Almeron. Um, so first of all, uh, on behalf of the Penn Center for Mental Health and the Penn Implementation Science Center, we are incredibly excited to have Dr. Danny Almeron here today, virtually. Um, Dr. Almeron is an associate professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Michigan. He runs the DQ Lab, Advancing Intervention Data Science by Design. I could spend the whole time talking about his accomplishments, but I'm not going to do that because you're all here to hear from Danny, not from me. Um, but I do want to note that Danny leads a P50 from NIDA focused on methods for optimizing multi-level uh, adaptive implementation strategies. So he is the person to hear about this topic from, and his work is really at the cutting edge. I also want to note that Danny is an incredible colleague in his brilliance and generosity. I first met him in 2012 at a workshop on adaptive design, and I was simply stunned by his ability to simplify and teach really complex topics in a way that everyone can understand. Um, and I know you'll feel the same way after hearing this talk. So I'm going to pass the baton over to Dr. Almorel, and thank you all for joining us um, and really excited to hear your talk. Awesome. Thanks, Renad. And thank you and David and the rest of the team, um, including Danny B, for inviting me today to do this. I'm super excited and, and really grateful. It's only, it's only too bad I'm not there in person. That's the only catch. All right. So I'll pause for a second and make sure everybody can see my screen. We can see and hear you. Okay. All right. Well, this is awesome. All right. So let's get right to it. And I really look forward to some of the conversations I'll be having with some of you later today. Um, also, what's really cool is I've only ever been called a distinguished scientist twice in my life. <laughs> and, and it's always with an implementation science crowd. Everybody else, they don't think I'm distinguished at all. So this is really awesome. And I just want to keep giving talks to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is terrific. Okay, so um, here's my title. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something called adaptive implementation strategies. It's still new-ish enough that I can still give talks on it, but then toward the end of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about where I'm going, which is in the parentheses, and where I'm going with this research is really the focus of one of five projects in our P50. It's the one I'm leading. Um, and so beginning of the talk is rather older things. Toward the end of the talk, things start to get a little newer. Maybe for some of you, it's all new. Okay, so here we go. Oh, and I have a bunch of collaborators. Some of, some of the implementation scientists I work with are Amy Kilborn and Andrew Kwanbeck at Wisconsin. Amy's here at Michigan. And there's a whole host of other people that have shaped how I think today. I didn't get here by myself. Okay. So don't worry, you see down here 136, you have nothing to worry about. Um, I don't have 136 slides for 50 minutes, I promise. Um, it's probably like 30 or 40 slides and I'll try to end on time. I'm looking at my clock right here and I will be respectful of your time. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna try to do in 50, 50 minutes or so, so 10 minutes a piece. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is an adaptive implementation strategy so that we're all on the same page. I'm going to introduce this concept, which some people find interesting. I'm only spending two slides on it, but it's important, which is the concept of optimizing any intervention. In this case, I'm talking about optimizing an adaptive implementation strategy. I'm going to introduce something called clustered smarts, which are very exciting. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a couple examples. In fact, that's really how I'm gonna introduce them is by giving you examples. And then, like I said, toward the end of my talk, I'm gonna be hopefully getting you super excited about what's in store over the next four to five years of my career, okay? All right. So some of you know this implementation scientist, Clay Cook, he's a, a friend of mine. He said, you know, I like the way he, he frames it because it's really simple to understand what works is not actually what gets implemented in practice. Pretty straightforward. We all know about that on this, on this call. And implementation science focuses on producing knowledge about effective techniques, okay? My other friend, Aaron Lyons, this is one, uh, something from one of his papers. And these effective techniques, which are supposed to get evidence-based practices into the real world, have this fancy name called implementation strategy, okay? For someone like me, a statistician, um, these implementation strategies are nothing more than an intervention. But I realized that um, 
in our world, in our implementation science world, we try not to call them interventions because the intervention is this other thing that is intervening on the patient. So I'll go along with um, our norms here. Okay, so as many of you know or might agree, and if you disagree, I wanna hear about it, implementation often entails a sequential organization specific approach. The reason I say organization, because that, that was my best catch all for the types of things we're usually intervening on in implementation, which is clinics, schools, you know, hospitals, clinic teams, uh, clinicians. These, these are organizations or groups of people whereby implementation strategies are adapted and readapted over time. So everything I'm gonna talk about today is nothing more, this idea of an adaptive implementation strategy, and I still have a few more slides to really drive home the point, is nothing more than a guide for intervening in this way. That's it, that's all it is. It's a guide for implementers on how they ought to intervene to get what they want, which is in implementation science, the adoption of some evidence-based practice. And this is more of a mouthful, but it was important that I pause and share it with you down here at the bottom, because it's more of a formal definition. An adaptive implementation strategy is a pre-specified sequence of rules used to guide how best to adapt and readapt strategies over time, both strategically and based on the changing status of the organization. And I'm gonna give you some examples. I'm gonna give you one, one example, okay? Okay. So here's an example of an adaptive implementation strategy. This comes from a study that is currently under review. So I'm not gonna be able to tell you any of the results, but man, I'm dying to tell you because they're pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, the whole purpose of this implementation strategy, which I'm about to discuss, was to get CBT adopted by school professionals across high schools in the state of Michigan. I don't need to say anything about CBT to this group, but I, you might be surprised to know that in the state of Michigan, um, every high school has between one and three school professionals. And believe it or not, and this surprised me uh, five, six years ago when I first started writing this grant, our school professionals in the state of Michigan are not using evidence-based practices. So we crafted this study where we were gonna say, okay, let's learn how best to get CBT into the hands of school professionals and these school professionals are those that are in charge of sort of substance use services and mental health services at the high schools. The good thing about Michigan is we have between one and three of these in every high school. That's already there, okay? Okay, so let me tell you what this implementation strategy that is right in front of you is. This is an example adaptive implementation strategy. At the beginning, say in January, okay, we do an in-person training where and, and we probably do, and we actually did this region-wide at the district level. So this is a district level strategy over here on the left, where all the school professionals from a county or uh, multiple counties from a district came together and we trained them all day. You know, everybody always kicks off with a training. Uh, we trained them all day in the basic principles of CBT. And we also did one extra thing, this rep thing, uh, which is called replicating effectiveness programs. This is what I call a very, very light version of facilitation. So light, in fact, that it actually requires the schools or school professionals to call, call the sort of call facility, to call the experts when they need us. That's how light it is. So we're not burdening them. We're not intervening on them. That's the very first thing we do is those two things, training and rep. So we train them, we pat them on the back, and we say, we're here for you, give us a call. <laughs> okay, a few months later, in this very same adaptive implementation strategy, we have a coaching intervention. Coaching, as you know, is extremely expensive. It's nothing like this first strategy over here. Coaching means, uh, in this case, that we're actually driving out to the school. Believe it or not, this intervention took place prior to COVID. So we're actually, we actually drove out to, every, to 100 schools in the state of Michigan, and we sat with them and tried to shore up their CBT skills. Of course, between January and when we showed up, we were hoping that they had tried out some of the CBT or maybe put some of these things in place. And so we thought around month two would be a good time to come in and start seeing how they're doing and improving their CBT skills. 
right around month four, which I believe took place right after the holiday break. So this might have changed a little bit. We took a snapshot of this of each school and we said, how is this school doing? Is this school doing pretty good or is this school doing not so good? And the bar we set here for whether or not the school's doing pretty good is very low. Okay. This is an extremely low bar. Let me tell you what it is. Every school professional at the school has delivered in the course of four months, three or more CBT sessions, talk about a low bar, to at least 10 students, which is a low bar because we know that at all these high schools, there's plenty more than 10 students that need this and identified less than two delivery barriers. If it ain't broke, don't fix it is what we did. So if the answer is yes, we continued rep plus coaching. That is keep calling us, you know, if you have trouble, we're gonna continue coaching you. So once we start coaching, we never take it away until the end of the year, right? If on the other hand, the answer is no, we added a new intervention, a new strategy called facilitation. Now this one is the real deal facilitation. And so this one is what I call a business oriented strategy. We are basically proactively calling every week or at least once a month, the school professionals having phone calls with them and talking to them about the barriers they're experiencing and trying to troubleshoot what's going on. The reason I say this is more business oriented is because I'm trying to draw a contrast between facilitation and coaching. Coaching is trying to shore up the skill base for the evidence-based strategy. Facilitation is trying to take down any organizational barriers that exist at the school that are not letting the school professional do their job and deliver CBT. And believe it or not, there's a bunch of those, including but not limited to, they can't find the room, they don't have the support from their principal, and so on and so on and so on. Okay. This entire thing I've just shown you is a single adaptive implementation strategy, okay? There's no study here. This is just, here it is. This is what I would do if I was an implementer and going out in the state of Michigan and wanting to get CBT adopted at these schools, okay? Let me pause here for a second and I'll take some questions. Or I don't know, Renette, I don't know if you want to do it at the end. Either way is fine by me. Okay. Danny, totally your call. Um, okay. But, okay. Uh, I did ask folks to put questions in the chat. And okay. uh, it looks like Ashley has a clarification question yeah. if you want to answer that. I love Ashley's question because she said, who are we? Who is doing the coaching and the facilitation? And I'm actually going to jump ahead to answer that question. Okay. And then I'll jump back to my slides because I already have an answer for this. Okay. Um, who are the adaptive implementation strategies for. So Ashley, I'm trying to answer your question and then I'll go back to my talk. The adaptive implementation strategies are not intended for researchers. I'm gonna make a big fuss about that in a second. They are for and done by implementers. This is so important what I'm saying right now. And it goes, it is so muddled in our literature that it's, that I'm gonna spend five more minutes on it, a Amy. So I'm so, Ashley, I'm so glad you asked. So for example, the adaptive implementation strategy could be either for implementation practitioners, community service providers, uh, service provider organizations, policymakers. And notice how I crossed out researchers. Adaptive implementation strategies are not for researchers unless they are a researcher who happens to take off their researcher hat and decided to do implementation for the day of which we have a bunch of us, <laughs> okay? So in this example that I was sharing with you, the adaptive implementation strategy was for and was done by a nonprofit organization in the state of Michigan called Trails. Okay. And their whole game, their whole business model, if you will, of this nonprofit is they want to get effective mental health services in all schools in Michigan and beyond. That's it. They wake up day and night. That's all they care about. So, this thing I just showed you over here, all right is not for me, and it's probably not for 90% of, of the folks on this call. It is for implementers. All right, now that I've answered, hopefully, Sarah and Ashley's question about who it's for and who's doing it, <laughs> all right, um, I am gonna hit you on the head with an important concept that I think is way too muddled in our literature. An adaptive implementation strategy is not a research method. And here's the thing, y'all, no implementation strategy is a research method. 
That's otherwise we're just replicating everything that got us into implementation science in the first place. You know, if the researchers are doing it, then we're not getting it into the real world, right? Isn't that the reason we're here? Well, we're going to repeat that problem again, unless we are really clear, if we, unless we create a firewall between who these things are for and who they're not for. Okay, so this example strategy I gave you is not a research method. So it's not an experimental design. It's not an adaptive trial design. Please don't say it is. It is not a way of conducting a pilot study or usability study. And it is not an approach to rapid cycle research, which is a very hot topic right now. And I'll be giving a talk sometime in the next couple of weeks at NCI on, on this idea of rapid cycle research. So an adaptive implementation strategy is a package of implementation strategies that lives in the real world and is to be used by implementers. Okay, here's another confusing thing before I go on. Um, there's a lot of confusing between the way I use the word adaptive and the word adaptation. And the reason I think it's confusing is because the, the folks using the word adaptation are also not being clear about whether they're doing research or whether they're doing implementation. So here, I don't take sides because I don't need to. So for those of you who view adaptation as a research tool, an adaptive implementation strategy has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's not a research tool. <laughs> so imagine a world where scientists don't exist. You know, all of us are out of a job. An adaptive implementation strategy may still be in action out there in the great state of Michigan. Okay. All right. For those of you who view adaptation as one of various possible implementation strategies, like I said, this is quite muddled in the literature. Okay. Some folks do view adaptation as a thing an implementer might do. And I think it's, and I think it's great. Then an adapt, then such an adaptive ad adaptation strategy may well be one of the strategies included in an adaptive implementation strategy. You can see why this is confusing, okay? You can totally see why this is confusing. So in other words, all I'm saying here is maybe one of these components could have been adaptation, okay? If in fact you view adaptation <laughs> as an implementation strategy, okay? All right, hopefully I'm clarifying some really crazy ideas that are floating around our literature right now. So this is the significant section of your grant or when you're trying to go to the state of Michigan and telling them why you wanna do this. Why do you wanna use this? Or why do you wanna develop one? It's because a strategy that works for one organization may not work for the other. So in the state of Michigan, we have as many states do, uh, low resource schools and high resource schools. It may be that the high resource schools need different strategies than the low resource schools. Well, an adaptive implementation strategy might be one way for you to think of intervening on all of those schools and adapting what you do depending on their needs, okay? Another reason you might wanna do or use or develop an adaptive implementation strategy is because what works now may not work later. A third one, well, that one's pretty straightforward, right? We all love, love that. And, and, and it, it makes sense and people understand it. The third one is a little more subtle, which is that the sequencing of strategies might matter. The thing I try up front might matter in terms of what I try next, should you be failing. Or the thing I try up front might matter for what I do next, should you be succeeding. In other words, let's not fool ourselves if I go into a school and I intervene with one thing, and then I go in and I intervene four months later with something else, that sequencing might matter. And an adaptive implementation strategy is a guide for you to think about how you might sequence your strategies on the organization. All of these are basically the simplest way to describe all four of these is one size doesn't fit all. That's the bottom line. And we're always in that case. We are always in the one size doesn't fit all case unless you're focusing on an extremely narrow group organization or something like that, okay? All right, I already did this slide, thanks to, uh, thanks to Ashley. All right, I'm gonna look in the chat really quick before I shift gears here. Adaptation can also be a research strategy, no? Yep, it can be. And like I said, I think it's pretty muddled, <laughs> okay? All right, let's move on. So the next thing I wanna do is I'm shifting gears to the second part of my talk which is a very short section of my talk, which is what does it mean to develop an optimized adaptive implementation strategy? 
I just want to say, just to hit you over the head yet again, from this point on, this is the first time I'm actually talking about science in this entire talk. This is the very first time. So this is my mad scientist. <laughs> so this is all of us, okay? Or 90% of us on this call. So there's basically three directions you can take. I, be, I think there's only three direct, I think there's three directions you can take if you are a, a mad scientist doing research on adaptive implementation strategies. The first one is you might be in the preparation phase. This happens to a lot of K awardees or early career people, right? They're doing pilot studies and you could do a pilot study on an adaptive implementation strategy, right? Or you might be doing some observational data analyses to get you ready to put together an adaptive implementation strategy to figure out what the tailoring variables ought to be and so on and so forth. The second thing you might be, the second stage you might be in as a researcher is you might be interested in optimizing. That is, you might be interested in, you have an idea for an adaptive implementation strategy, but you want to make it better. And I'm going to explain what that means in the next slide with greater detail. But the third one, before I do that, the third one is where 80% of you are, <laughs> which is you're an evaluator. You, you have an adaptive implementation strategy in your hands. You feel like it's pretty good and you're ready to rock and roll and go evaluate it. In fact, in the old days, um, no one even thought about optimization. Everybody was either doing a pilot study or doing an evaluation RCT. I'm here to tell you that it might be a really good idea for you to pit stop along the way in optimization land and make sure that your strategy, whatever it is, adaptive implementation strategy or some other multi-component strategy is optimized before you go evaluate it. And some of us, including Linda Collins and, and others that write in this area, we believe that doing a pit stop here might actually be to the benefit of our science. In other words, right now we're seeing a lot of people go from their pilot studies straight to evaluation and guess what? They don't find any effects because they didn't optimize. That's all I'm gonna say today about what it means to optimize. Let me now be very specific about what it means to optimize an adaptive implementation strategy. What it means is that we, mad scientists, are gonna be asking some pretty interesting questions that are not, does it work? Here is what it looks like. We might be asking questions such as, in the context of an adaptive implementation strategy, what's the effect of offering versus not offering the coaching? So given that I'm gonna do this whole thing, what if I pluck out the coaching intervention or leave it in? I'm still doing this huge intervention, right? This huge multi-component intervention, but do I really need the coaching? Coaching is expensive. Can I just get away with training rep? And if, the, if they're not doing well, add facilitation? That I view as an optimization question because you're really genuinely trying to figure out, do I really need this coaching intervention? But it gets even more fun than that. Optimization gets even more fun than that. You might be asking, which are the schools that benefit the most from coaching? That's an even more interesting question because in fact, this adaptive implementation strategy could be a little more nuanced. It could be that you do in-person training and rep for all schools, but only schools that are lacking in skills get the coaching and schools that are not don't get the coaching. So it's almost like there would be another fork here based on whether the school seems to have the skills following your in-person training and rep, right? Or the resources to try it out, right? So that also is an implement is an optimization question. And then let me go a little faster with the next one here. For schools that are not yet adopting CBT by month four, that is these schools that are no here, do I really need facilitation? Okay. Um, or here's an even better question. Did I miss the boat altogether with this definition of what it means to be a suboptimally responding school at month four? In other words, do I need a more nuanced or a better definition with different measures altogether for what it means to be a non-responding school. All of those are optimization questions in my book. You guys see that? And I, right now is where I wish I was giving a talk in Philadelphia and looking at your faces to see if you were getting it or not. But all of these are examples of optimization questions in my mind, okay? Okay, I'm looking at the chat just to make sure. 
So Elisa Stevens said, are pilots an optimizing iterative before proceeding to evaluation? Absolutely. Yeah. If you feel like you're you you've 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 done you're done optimizing and you don't quite feel like you're ready to evaluate based on whatever bar you set for that, just go go back right back to optimizing or maybe even go right back to um, preparing before you evaluate. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I've now gone through two parts of my talk and it is 1226. I'm doing pretty good because the longest part was the first talk, first part. So I'm about to shift gears to a novel, a very novel kind of experimental design called a clustered smart. Before I do that, I'm going to pause and see if anyone has any questions in the chat box. Any questions? Danny, it looks like Morgan has a question about how excited are grant reviewers with proposals that are focused on optimization as opposed to evaluation? Yeah, and my answer to that is the reviewers are super excited if the optimization questions you're asking, asking are pretty exciting. <laughs> so I'm putting it back on you. So. If you're asking optimization questions that really matter, according to your, you know, your reviewers, then they get super, super excited, Morgan. And in fact, these questions that I listed here, um, you know, this, I may, I'm making it seem simple, like I just whipped these up, you know, a minute ago, but that's, that's not the case. These questions, it took me, um, it took me, I think it was six months that we were designing this study. I'm about to tell you about. It was about six months of work for us to finally pin down on these questions right here. And of course, we wrote a grant where we posed these questions to the reviewers and said, look, here's why these questions are so important. Please give us money to answer them. And they were very excited to do that. So I hope that helps Morgan and April. And Danny, um, yeah. there's one more question from Sarah related to grant grants personship. Um, is a grant one of those most phases or a combination of all a grant proposal? I, I, I haven't yet seen a researcher who has enough money to do all these in one grant. Um, and I, to be honest, I doubt I will. You know, NCI is really interested in rapid cycles research. The last time they had a call with me, I told them, you need to up the budget <laughs> or give us more than five years or something like that. I mean, upping the budget is probably the way to go. I mean, chances are, if you're lucky and you're, you know, you have the budget for it within that 1.5 million, you might be able to do preparation and optimization, maybe. Um, I rarely, if ever, see anybody doing optimization and evaluation in the same grant. I have never seen anyone do prep, optimize, and evaluate in the same grant. All right. I mean, just think about it, right? Your typical two-arm confirmatory randomized trial, which is the one we do down here for evaluation, is usually three to five years long, right? So, you know, most of the time I see somebody do a K, uh, I, I see somebody do a K award with optimization, uh, with preparation. And then I see somebody do an R01 for optimization and a second R01 for evaluation. But um, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. It just depends on your budget. Is that satisfactory answer, Renette? Yep. Beautiful. Okay. All right, so we're chugging along here and now I'm gonna continue my talk. It's uh, 1230. Okay, here we go. So what is a clustered smart? Okay, a clustered smart it's a, it's, a, it's a type of randomized trial design. It's actually a type of factorial design. And it's special because it's a multi-stage factorial design. That's what actually makes it special. And the reason we have multiple stages in a SMART is, and this should be of no surprise now, since you've heard the first half of the talk, we are about to talk about how we can use a SMART to optimize an adaptive implementation strategy. And an adaptive implementation strategy has multiple stages, as you just saw, multiple stages of intervention, that is multiple stages of implementation. So a SMART is a trial that a mad scientist would do to try to come up with a really good, that is optimized adaptive implementation strategy, okay? The other thing that makes clustered SMART special is this word clustered. Because most of us in implementation science are often intervening, that is our strategies are often on organizations, clinics, clinic pods, clinic teams, schools, whole communities, whatever. We often intervene at the cluster level, that is our strategies are at the cluster level, but most of the time for most of us scientists, our primary outcome is at the level of individuals within the organization. So for example, 
Um, in, in, in the examples I've been giving you earlier today, the outcome could either be at the level of the school professional within the school. Remember, there's anywhere between one and three of them. So the school professionals are clustered or the outcome is, in, is at the level of the student at the high school, right? Ideally, the things we do in implementation improve mental health outcomes of the kiddos, right? That's the ultimate objective. So if my analysis were analyzing an outcome like that, those kids are all clustered at the schools. And that's why we have the term clustered, okay? All right, clustered smarts were developed explicitly for the purpose of empirically developing optimized clustered adaptive interventions with, or optimized adaptive implementation strategies. So basically the reason I had this slide before, the only reason I had this slide before was to explain to y'all that smarts live right here in the middle. You're not doing a smart if you're evaluating. Let me say that again. You are not doing a SMART if you're doing a confirmatory evaluation trial. Now, you might be doing a SMART if you're a K awardee, but it might be a what I call a pilot SMART because as a K awardee, you want to start getting all the skills so that you can do the full-blown optimization R1 SMART. So, so you might be doing a SMART in, a, in, a, in preparation. You definitely are doing a SMART in optimization. You definitely are not using a SMART when you're evaluating. Here's an example. So now I'm moving into the fourth part of my talk. Okay, 12.32, I'm doing good. Um, and I'm gonna show you two examples of smarts just to give you a sense of what's possible here. Um, and these are respectively the second and third clustered smarts ever designed in all of implementation sciences, science. I'm not gonna show you the first one because I've given too many talks on it and I've already published on it. And so I'm showing you the second and third clustered smarts ever. And it, the first one is related to the example, our, our running example. Okay, so let's go slowly through this. Remember, I'm showing you now a smart. So what we did is we recruited 100 schools across the state of Michigan. On average, we had 200 school professionals, because like I said, we have anywhere between one and three, and the average is about two school professionals per high school. And what we did is we randomized, a little circle with an R means I randomized. We randomized these schools at month one to whether or not they get coaching, okay? And of course, why did we do that? We did that because we wanna answer one of those optimization questions. The first one, in fact, the first and second one, which is, do we really need schools? What's the effectiveness of coaching? Do we really need schools to, to receive coaching? or to be offered coaching? And secondly, which schools among those that we are recruiting are the ones that really need coaching? Maybe it's the low resource ones. Well, as all of you know, the mantra is when you don't know the answer, you randomize. So because we don't really have a good science yet about what are the factors that ought to help us determine who gets coaching, that is what schools get coaching, we randomize, okay? Then we take our measure of whether a school is responding or suboptimally responding. And of course, this measure, everybody always wants to ask me a lot of questions about how I came up with this. So the way we came up with this measure is we had some data lying around from a previous study. Um, and in this previous study, we had some data with coaching and then some data without coaching. What we discovered is that schools right around month four that had not met this criteria were, were not gonna meet the criteria a year later. In other words, right around the four month mark, this criteria for what we considered suboptimally responding or optimally responding was extremely prognostic of what the future looks like. Well, that's perfect, right? That's perfect rationale for us using it because it gives us the rationale for us to do what we're doing next, which is the schools that are suboptimally responding we're gonna re-randomize them to whether or not they get facilitation because we're trying to fix that problem we saw in that prior data, okay? <laughs> I hope that's as clear as I can make it. So a lot of the times when you're trying to come up with how you define the measure of response, non-response, a lot of the time you're looking at your prior data. So you might be doing that as part of a K award. You might be doing that as part of, you know, your postdoc and your mining Renat or David's data from three studies back. And all of that is, is perfect for you figuring out 
you know, do we need an adaptive implementation strategy here? And you might get lucky. You might find some signal there that there's an interesting variable that you believe based on your analyses, if a school is responding as well as that variable suggesting, the school absolutely does not need facilitation. And that's essentially what's been encoded here. Let me say it again in different words. Okay, this is really important. So if you've been sleeping, wake up. What we've encoded in the study is that is the following fact, okay, or strong conjecture, which is if a school is responding based on this criteria, we don't believe the school should ever have the ability, you know, should, should ever receive or be offered facilitation. It doesn't make sense. Okay, that is something I'm bringing to the table here, not something I'm evaluating. Okay, so the cool thing about smarts is you can incorporate things you think you already know or things you already know. So we felt pretty strongly about this analysis and about this cutoff. And we felt strongly given the low resource settings across Michigan, that if a school is responding according to this cutoff, that school ought not be considered for facilitation. And so we embedded that fact into the study and only the suboptimally sub responding schools are gonna get re-randomized to whether or not we give them facilitation. Let me pause there and let that simmer for a second. Cause I just went through a lot, what I just did. I just went through a lot. Okay. Danny, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So um, does that basically assume that once you determine a school is responding, like what if that school over time stops responding or has difficulties or new leadership um, and there's a change? Right, so it, remember in the data set we analyzed, the schools had gotten rep or had gotten some version of this coaching. And we noticed in that data set that right around month four, and remember in this data set, these schools continued getting coaching or continued getting rep, okay? Just realize that, put your head in that mindset. We, we noticed that these schools, if they were responding, they were just gonna, they were gonna sail, they were gonna do good. So yes, what you just asked is extremely important, which is can these schools fall off the wagon? Yes, they can. And if they were to, your design might be entirely different. We noticed, in our data, that if the school was sailing pretty good at month four, meeting this low bar, they were either going to keep sailing or keep doing better. Now, does that answer your question, Renad? Yes, thank you. Yes. But but let me let me answer your question a different way, because we don't think that if the schools were doing good at month four, that they were ever going to fall off the wagon based on what we knew about these schools. However, suppose you didn't. Suppose you didn't buy that. Then you have a big decision to make here. You might actually have a third stage later where you continuing to monitor that school and maybe at month eight, you look again to see how the, the school is doing to see if they're suboptimally responding at month eight. In other words, they were doing great at month four, they fell off the wagon at month eight, and then at month eight, you decide whether, whether to add facilitation or not. That is perfectly doable, Renad. And we discussed it. Like I said, it took me about six months to design this trial. We discussed it and our team came to the conclusion that we didn't need to do that, that all we needed to know is how they were doing at month four. But, but I have designed other studies before, Renad, where uh, kids that were, non, that were responding at month four, we continued monitoring them and some of them transitioned into the next stage much later, like at month seven or month eight. That is possible. That's just not being done in this trial. Okay. Somebody is asking, Gwendolyn Lawson is asking, in this example, it seems like we're thinking at the organization level, schools responding or not. Can you speak to applying the same logic to the individual level? Yes, of course. So actually my first 10 years of work were on a topic called adaptive interventions, which is how I got into this area. In adaptive interventions, we do what a typical clinician would do is we would monitor the kiddo we give a kiddo, you know, CBT, we monitor the kiddo. And if the kiddo is falling off the wagon, we might add some medication, right? So that's, that's slightly older work. The same concepts apply there that they apply here with a, with, a, with a bunch of caveats. Here, we're dealing with organizations. It's a little messier, a lot messier, <laughs> you know? And here we're intervening at the level of the school rather than at the level of the individual. But the short answer, Gwendolyn, is of course, yes, we could do adaptive interventions 
at individual level. And we do do that. And we have a science space for that. Um, I hope that helps. Okay. Julie, Julie's S is asking, what about exogenous, that is outer context shocks that impact how the schools are doing, where prior performance doesn't predict how well they do? Right. So like, you know, a policy was implemented at month three or something like that, right? <laughs> or, or maybe, you know, maybe like a new superintendent <laughs> was hired right at month three, right? Or something like that. Um, well, if it happens before month, in between month one and four, all right, or pandemic, right, Julie? <laughs> or the pandemic, right? So if it happens between one months one and four, then that's a very interesting factor that you can use to determine, you know, um, if suppose that that outer context external shock hits some schools harder than others, you know, suppose it's not like uniform across the world or across the district, you know, then you could actually use that information to decide whether or not to add facilitation. It just becomes another covariate. Isn't that interesting? Because remember, part of what this study is doing is it's not just asking what is the effect of facilitation versus no facilitation among suboptimally responding schools? It's also asking among suboptimally responding schools, which are the schools that need facilitation? And it might be that if you're a school that had an exogenous shock by a new superintendent who happened to be trained at UPenn um, under David and Renad, they might be very implementation science, you know, uh, you know, smart, and they might, they might not need facilitation, right? So hopefully that answers your question, Julie. All right, let me move on here. A lot of you might be thinking, okay, Danny, this looks cool. It also looks very complicated. What is the primary aim here? If I'm writing a grant, the primary aim has to be simple and I have to be able to describe it to the reviewers who are very busy. Well, let me show you what the primary aim was in this, that the primary aim I chose for this design. All right, what I pitched to the team and they all went for it was, listen, why don't we imagine a world where all the schools in the state of Michigan get this adaptive implementation strategy up here? This is, the, this is the first one I showed you way back, like slide three, okay? I start off with rep, I do coaching. If the school's not doing well, I add facilitation, right? So imagine if every school in the state of Michigan got this top box versus if every school in the state of Michigan, all they got was the training and the rep, nothing more. They didn't get coaching, they didn't get facilitation. This is the question I pitched to our team when I was designing this trial. And I said, look, we have the ability to answer this question, which is really simple to explain to a group of reviewers. Even in a study that is a seemingly as complex as this, we have the ability to answer this question. That is, what is the effectiveness of this fancy schmancy, complicated and costly adaptive implementation strategy versus something that isn't even adaptive. It's just show up, do a district-wide training and rock and roll <laughs> and just give rep the whole time, all right? Now, you're probably scratching your head thinking, Danny, how, how in the world did you get to this, from this to this? Well, take a look. I want you to get your magnifying glass and look a little closely. Inside of our seemingly complicated design, the schools in blue, the first two boxes up here, are schools that never get coaching and never get facilitation. So embedded in my design is this lower intervention strategy, which is basically do the training, offer them rep, and walk off. You can think of that as as close as we're going to get to usual care in this study. In fact, that's how I pitched it to my team. I said, look, this will make a good usual care arm, even though it's not really usual care. Okay, it's, it's pretty darn close. It's really inexpensive. You just showed up, you did the training, you walked off, okay? And then you're asking, well, Danny, where'd this complicated guy come from? Well, that's this other color down here in, in flamingo pink or whatever it is, okay? Um, which is some schools got both coaching and, and, and facilitation if you were not responder. So basically the primary aim in the study is the blue schools, the schools that ended up on these two blue boxes, versus the pink schools. Isn't that totally cool? That was our primary aim. We told the reviewer, we are gonna have enough sample size to answer this question with certainty. That's what we told the reviewer. And then we tell the reviewer, by the way, 
not only can we answer this as a primary aim, we're going to be able to do all sorts of other fun things, such as who are the schools that need coaching? Who are the suboptimally were schools that need facilitation? Of course, those were lower ordered aims. And we may, we're not as powered for those, but that's okay. Um, there's no rule, gasp, that you must be powered for every question you ever ask of a study. This is such a crazy misconception. Uh, I don't know how we got there. <laughs> but guys, in any study you ever propose, the sample size is determined by the primary thing you want to answer. You better darn have the sample size for that primary thing. Everything else is for fun, you know, and you, you're not going to have 80% power for everything else. You might have 75% power or 66, or you might be willing to tolerate a type one error of 10%. You know what I mean? And, and that's how I, I view the design of these trials. All right, let me pause there for some questions. I, it's 1247. I have 15 more minutes. Everybody's doing pretty good. Okay, I don't see the chat moving. So I do see Morgan is asking me, how did you get access to all these schools? Well, remember that we did all of these interventions, all of these strategies through the trails team. Remember the trails, that, that's not a group of scientists. Those are brick and mortar implementers here in the great state of Michigan. And they had access to all these schools. They had, you know, they had contacts. And so everything went through them. When I say everything, I mean, the implementation went through them. The research assessments went through us, right? Because I'm a researcher. I hope that helps, Morgan. Okay, let me show you another trial that I'm really excited about. And this one, um, the, the data is not even in yet. So I, I don't have anything, ex you know, well, I can't tell you about the other study and I definitely can't tell you anything about this one. I can't even tell you if I'm excited about it yet, <laughs> but I am excited about the design. So here we're trying to improve opioid prescribing in primary care. As some of you know, opioid prescribing in primary care is one, not the, but one of the contributors to the opioid crisis. It turns out we were, we were prescribing away, not according to guidelines established by the CDC. Um, and so what we did in this study is we're trying to say, well, maybe we need an adaptive implementation strategy to figure out how to intervene on these clinics. These are clinics across Wisconsin and, and Michigan, Northern Michigan. And the question is, um, you know, what do we do to these sites, these clinics to get them to, you know, be more guideline concordant in their prescribing practices. So these are non-cancer seeing primary care clinics, okay? And I'm gonna walk you through this, but, but I'll tell you what the punchline is in a second. The first intervention is, um, you know, a, again, an, an educational meeting, which is just a training and audit and feedback. Audit and feedback is just this system that we are going to use to give data back, not research data, implementation data, back to each clinic to tell them how they're doing in terms of their opioid prescribing. So just imagine like a little dashboard when you walk into the clinic and it's telling you how many opioid prescriptions have gone out and whatnot, you know, just imagine that, okay? And what we did is that the third month following the training and the implementation of the audit and feedback, we randomized these clinics to whether or not they get practice facilitation, which is a facilitator is gonna go into the clinic and have little round table discussions every week with a group of nurses and other clinicians to talk about you know, they're going to do PDSA cycles and all sorts of fun th things about what is it in our opioid prescribing policies and the way we do it in our clinic that things are getting out of hand. You know, they're going to walk through that. And then at month six, okay, notice I don't have a tailoring variable here. At month six, all of these clinics are again getting re-randomized to whether or not they get PPC. PPC is physician peer coaching. So the, one of the interesting things you're going you're gonna to notice about this study as opposed to the other one is here, facilitation comes before coaching. That's pretty interesting. And in the school setting, coaching came before facilitation. Oh man, that was an interesting conversation. You know, this study took me also six months to design. It turns out that with primary care clinics, you can't really directly start intervening on the clinicians. It's just not going to work. It's just the culture and the way these clinics work. You first have to think about intervening on the practice itself, you know, using ne not necessarily prescribers and only later consider or not whether or not you're going to bring in a coaching for a specific prescriber 
or, or for a group of prescribers. Whereas in the school setting, I learned the complete opposite. In the school setting, every time I talked to these people over the course of six months in designing that study, they kept telling me, Danny, you can't do facilitation right out of the back, right out of the gates. The, the school professionals need to try coaching first. <laughs> Otherwise, they don't even know what barriers they, they're, they're so foggy brained about what their barriers are if they haven't even tried coaching. They don't even have the skills for coaching. So very interesting dynamics here. But here's the really interesting thing, y'all. I don't have a tailoring variable here. Every clinic got re-randomized. Renad, this answers your other question earlier about, Danny, how'd you come up with the tailoring variable in that other study? In this study, we couldn't come up with one. In other words, in this study, we have to wait until this study is over to decide among the clinics that were randomized to getting the coaching versus not, which are the ones that really needed it. So in other words, whereas in the first study, we knew what to do with responding schools, but didn't know what to do with suboptimally responding schools. Here, we don't know what to do with all of them. So I couldn't embed that information into this trial. And instead, we have ourselves a clustered SMART where all the clinics are re-randomized. But guess what, y'all? This is still about optimizing an adaptive implementation strategy because my overarching aims are to figure out which clinics need the facilitation and which clinics need the coaching. Super interesting, right? All right. My time is almost up. I have eight minutes left. Everyone always asks me about sample size, so I'm gonna include it, but I am gonna go a little fast. Um, for those of you that know Steve and Marcus, getting a sample size is not gonna cost you $5. It's gonna be a little bit more than $5, okay? Right, Steven? So this is, from a, this is from a coffee shop in Ann Arbor that they sell coffee beans and right around the holidays, they always sell the sample. I had to take a picture of it because I thought it was awesome for a statistician. All right, so the sample size for a clustered SMART is just like the sample size for any two-arm randomized trial design, but you, you have an augmentation term here, two minus R, which has to do with the response rate at that midpoint. So for example, let's think about why it's two minus R, okay? Y'all ready for this? Let's pretend I was comparing the blue versus the red, okay? All right. Which is, which is what this sample size calculator is for. Well, if 100% a, if of my schools were responding, then none of them get re-randomized. There's no re-randomization here. So it's just this blue guy versus this guy. Well, that's just a two-arm trial. There was only one randomization, right? And that's why two minus one is one. It's the same sample size formula as for a two-arm randomized trial. However, if you have a response rate less than one, like say half, 0.5, then this two minus R is 1.5, right? So, well, that makes sense, right? Because, you know, now I have some schools here. And if you think about the extreme, if you think about if I have a zero response rate, then all the schools get re-randomized twice. Well, that's kind of like doing a four-arm trial, which is why you double your sample size formula for a two-arm trial. So the intuition is there for why we have a two minus R inflation factor. All right, guys, it's 12.54. I got six minutes left. Where do I wanna go for the next few years or where am I currently already going? Shout out to Steve, I see that he's there. So what's the leading edge and where, what am I actually spending all of my time doing? I'm not actually spending my time doing what I've just talked about. Here's what I'm, what I'm trying to do. I am currently developing this concept called a Maisie, okay? Which is a cute name, a Maisie. I thought it would be cute a multi-level adaptive implementation strategy. And what I'm trying to do here is, every time I gave these talks, I kept getting people telling me, well, Danny, you know, you're making it too simple. Like, in fact, when we do implementation, we always intervene on multiple levels, you know? But your first example, you were intervening only on schools and your second example, you're only intervening on clinics. So what I, I'm, I'm trying to right now, coming up with this concept of a Maisie, which is a multi-level adaptive. And the key idea here is that we're gonna be adapting strategies over time based on chain, you know, how the different levels are doing. So for example, you might, you might imagine that my very first strategies at the system level, 
my second strategy is at the clinic level, but then I'm going to be monitoring the prescribers within the clinics to see how they're doing rather than the whole clinic itself. And you can imagine that I, I would only be doing the coaching for the prescribers that are struggling rather than for the entire clinics that are struggling, right? So there's a multi-level aspect here and there's a sequencing aspect here. And when you mash them together, you get what, I, what I'm calling a Maisie for, for lack of a better name. If you have a better one, let me know. And this is kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, as a methodologist, that's usually what I do first is I try to get all my thoughts straight on what is the intervention design. And then after I get my, all my thoughts straight on what we do, if all of us scientists lost our jobs, then I move to, well, what I'm calling a my smart, which is a multi-level smart. So now we would have randomizations at the clinic and randomizations at the prescriber sometime later. Well, I'm here to tell you, this is hypothetical because it's never happened because I haven't even gotten my act together on a Maisie yet, although I'm close. Um, so this has never happened. And if it has, if somebody went rogue and did submit a grant like this, the methods don't exist yet to analyze them. <laughs> so, I mean, that's why I have a job. That's why I have this P50. So I am currently developing the tools that is sample size calculator, estimation approaches, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, all the things that your statisticians are going to use to design and analyze these studies. I'm currently developing those tools. It'll probably be another year or two before I have my big papers. Okay, that is it for today. You have learned, it is 1257. You've learned about, here's, what, here's a recap. You learned what an adaptive implementation strategy is. You learned what a clustered SMART is. You saw three clustered SMARTs. The last one you saw is pretty cool. It was, a main, it was an MI SMART. You, we were hopefully able to clarify some confusing concepts swimming around our crazy muddled literature. <laughs> I call implementation science the Wild West. And then finally, you got so excited about Maisie's and my smarts that you are going to shoot me an email and you are going to want to do a study with this with me so that by the time we get funded, I have the new methods ready to rock and roll. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much for your time. Danny, that was incredible. As always, um, we had close to 100 people here. Your energy flies through the Zoom, which is almost impossible, but it, 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 you can do it. Um, and I have to tell you, I've gotten texts, tweets, and emails about how brilliant you are. And my husband, who is a lawyer, not in the, the business, was just overhearing and he was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Uh, so I just want to call out that you are an incredible educator and we've all learned so much. Um, and 